Welcome to Nature's Moment, brought to you by Project Syndicate in association with the World Bank and High Impact Studio. My name is Anita Arnand. We are live from the Nature Positive Pavilion right here at COP15 in Montreal. Now, the question that we're asking is whether this really is nature's moment. Can an agreement be reached here to halt the devastating loss of biodiversity which threatens our economies and indeed the entire planet? And with the world's poorest, some of the most exposed to the ravages of biodiversity loss, do we need to fundamentally reevaluate our approach to economic development? Well, we have a, an awful lot of interesting things coming up for you. We're going to hear from the UN's Convention on Biodiversity's Executive Secretary, Elizabeth Mremer, former Colombian President and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Juan Manuel Santos, the World Bank's Marie Pangestu in conversation, and what is really going on here behind the scenes. We're going to have a frontline report. But first, shall we just remind ourselves about what is at stake? In just a moment, we're going to be coming to our first panel of the day. Uh, but first, what better way to kick things off than hearing from Juan Manuel Santos, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and former president of Colombia, on exactly why this COP15 is so very critical. Dear friends, it is a privilege to speak to you today as part of this timely event organized by Project Syndicate, the World Bank, and High Impact Studio. When I was first elected president of Colombia, I took over a country that was flooded for almost 18 months. The La Nina phenomenon, aggravated by climate change, meant it rained and rained and rained. What became very clear was that we not only had to make peace with the oldest and strongest guerrilla in the Western Hemisphere, but equally important for our survival, we had also to make peace with nature. So we acted quickly and with determination. Today, Colombia has declared more than 30% of its territory as protected areas. Loss of nature is also an economic issue because the collapse of essential ecosystems could lead countries like mine into bankruptcy. To take just one example, around 75% of food crops rely on animal pollination, bees, birds, butterflies, the loss of animal pollinators is simply unthinkable. We need to agree a global deal for nature to put the world's biodiversity on a path to recovery 
by 2030. This means a clear set of global goals, including concrete plans to protect 30% of land and ocean before the end of the decade. It is encouraging to see the World Bank already playing such a leading role in our discussions today. The World Bank can and must play a catalytic role in unlocking the flows of global finance needed to address both the climate and biodiversity crisis. We cannot afford to delay in creating ambitious targets to protect and restore biodiversity in the next decade. Thank you. Juan Manuel Santos there. Now, of course, we really want you to get involved in this conversation too. And you can do that by using the hashtag Nature's Moment. That's hashtag Nature's Moment. Time now, though, for our first session, the roots of development. We're going to be looking at that crucial role that biodiversity plays in economic development. Let's get down to business. And I'm delighted to say that we are joined by Mari Pengestu, Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank. We have K.M. Reyes with us, co-founder and advisor at the Center for Sustainability, PH. That's in Palawan in the Philippines. Welcome. Uh, Carol Lyle is with us, CEO of Domini Impact Investments, and we have Dr. Satendra Prasad, who is Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Fiji to the United Nations. Thank you very much for being with us, a really august panel, and this is a very important subject. KM, as a community organizer in the Philippines, just tell us about your experience of, of the economic cost of biodiversity degradation. So I come from a really special place in the Philippines. It's called Palawan. It's known as our country's last biodiversity frontier. And actually, the Philippines used to be 95% covered in pristine rainforest. And now only 3% of that rainforest is left. And to be able to connect biodiversity with economic growth, we can just look at what's happened in terms of patterns of migration. So Palawan for the longest time was completely, um, it was only inhabited by indigenous peoples and has been very remote and off the map for the entire Philippines for decades. As a result of forest loss, it's gone up to the 70s, 80s, we have nothing left. And obviously the Philippines is very well known for our typhoon season, like Typhoon Yolanda that killed hundreds of thousands of people in one full swoop. We've had a huge influx now of migrants that have come in from other parts of the Philippines because there are no other sources of livelihood if not those sources that are coming from our ecosystems, like our rainforests, whether that's for timber to create housing and homes, whether that's wildlife for poaching or for other forms just in terms of livelihood. And then our fisheries. We're an archipelago country. We're over 7,000 islands. And so it's a really clear indication of what by diversity or the lack thereof does, it completely changes the way that communities can connect with the, their immediate world and their day-to-day -day lives. Mm. Uh, Ambassador, I, I can see you sort of uh, nodding in sympathy, empathy, understanding. Is this the same experience that's going on in Fiji? Uh, nature is at the heart of uh, economy. Uh, nature is at the heart of our prosperity. Fiji is a, a very much a, a like Philippines. Uh, we also depend on tourism, for example, and uh, tourists go to Fiji because you can dive in our oceans on our corals. Our food uh, security is dependent on nature. We, we depend on marine as well as on uh, terrestrial sources of uh, food that is derived from uh, pristine biodiversity, and all of this is uh, highly exposed. Uh, if uh, we lose our biodiversity, our tourism is exposed, which is 50, 60 percent of our GDP and jobs and livelihoods of tens of thousands of our families uh, go away. At the same time, uh, if uh, some of these things uh, we, uh, we can and we are doing uh, by ourselves, but some of the things we need partnership at the global level. The 1.5 is not something Fiji with 
all its commitment and all its might and all its resources can achieve on its own. That's something that we need to uh, secure over here. And we are so close to so many planetary and biodiversity uh, tipping points. I hope uh, uh, that uh, this is not only a, a moment for nature, this is a moment for humanity. This is our one moment when so close to the planetary tipping points, uh, we have a moment where world's leaders are gathered that we can uh, take decisive action that uh, gets us back to a path of stability. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. I mean, you, you're touching on, on all of the sore points, as it were, international cooperation. Mary Pengestu, there are a few people on this green earth that I know who know more about international development and global discussion at the very highest level. Um, is it fair to say that there is still very much the notion out there that biodiversity is something that comes at a net economic cost rather than a net economic benefit? I think you're right. I think people don't see, I mean, at the moment, uh, there's kind of this misperception that addressing biodiversity or climate change is a cost. Uh, actually, investing in, bio, in nature and climate is about development. It is about the opportunity uh, for development and growth, and it's not a trade-off. And that's, that's really why we need to look at climate, nature, and development in an integrated way. Uh, and we know that if we don't do that, uh, we just heard two very uh, strong testaments about how much it's going to hurt the livelihoods of poor people and of the poorest countries. And you had a, a, a nice number in, in the slide just then, that 10% of the GDP of the lowest income countries are going to go, are going to be declining uh, in 2030, by 2030 if uh, any one of these uh, ecosystem uh, ser ser services, whether it's forestry or pollination, fails. Mm -hmm. And it is also going to affect food security. It's going to affect livelihoods and jobs. So we have to act now, and we have to act in an integrated way where climate, uh, na uh, nature, and uh, development have to be addressed in an integrated way. And under the right conditions, with the right financing, uh, you can actually achieve both, right? And this is really uh, what we, th we hope that this COP uh, can, uh, can prioritize and emphasize about what needs to be done uh, to get there. Uh, if, and, and you have to make that link between nature and climate. They're linked because climate drives nature losses and nature losses affect climate change. So you have to address it in an integrated way. Well, we're going to talk more about reframing the argument yeah. and, and maybe sort of following in the footsteps of, of what the climate activists have done. But, but first, I mean, you said you liked one of the numbers that we put on the screen. I'm going to show everybody a number that's going to chill you to the bone. Carol, before we, we come to you, it's a biggie. So 50% of global GDP depends on biodiversity and ecosystem services in some way or another. We're going to come to solutions in a moment, but if we can just spend a moment diagnosing the problem, how far, Carol, are we away from aligning our financial system to protecting biodiversity? I'm going to give, okay, good, we're on. Um, so I'm going to be the internal opt optimist here. I think we're not that far. Uh, this is coming off of two days here of being at COP15. And it is really exciting to see the gathering of governments, private enterprise, investors, hosting a finance day, and non-governmental organizations coming together focused on nature action. It's incredible to see the momentum that biodiversity has picked up and I think it's very clear to see the linkage between the concerns around climate and nature. They go hand in hand. So I think at the start, we're spending a lot of time talking about biodiversity, but I think we see ultimately the two merge together because they are a solution together. I mean, I mean it's, re it's really good with such grim figures to hear some optimism. But Marie Pengestu, coming, coming back to you, it's one thing to talk the talk. It's another thing to walk the walk. Um, how uh, are you feeling when you look, in, and you look around and see how countries are actually dealing with the problem? Are you as optimistic as Carol? You know, I, I think c countries need to be, uh, especially developing countries, will need to be supported to get there. 
right? Uh, we, we kind of know the what. We know that this, the risk uh, from not uh, addressing the nature losses is going to lead to devastating uh, development losses, poverty, inequality, livelihoods lost. Uh, so how do we make sure that developing countries can be supported? And it's really about first having an integrated approach to climate, uh, nature, and development. It's integrated. And uh, what does that mean? It means that we have to uh, support countries design the right kind of policies. The, the policy framework has to be one that integrates these uh, three aspects. And it is about uh, the kind of designing the policies uh, that, will, uh, uh, li that are linked to their longer term climate uh, go goals and biodiversity goals and making sure that you can still grow and develop, right? That's kind of the big framing, but then you, you have to bring it down uh, to the actual kind of policies that are needed to enable the financing to come in. That's basically the, the framing that we need uh, to have. And if you talk about the kind of the policies uh, that are needed, it is about making sure that uh, you have nature positive uh, uh, outcomes and uh, eliminate the, the nature negative uh, investments. Right, and that's about policies, it's about incentives, um, and making sure that something like, uh, you know, how do you uh, have a fiscal policy, for instance, in, uh, that does not reward uh, the, the, the destruction of nature, but in fact uh, provides positive, um, uh, nature positive outcomes. So I just give you an example like subsidies, uh, either fuel subsidies or fertilizer subsidies. They actually, uh, lead to behavior that uh, rewards uh, re uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Mm. Uh, in fact, you could use the same money and repurpose it uh, for uh, uh, agriculture production that is sustainable. And then you get uh, more uh, food production with less fertilizer, less water, and you also improve the livelihood of farmers. Well, right? I mean, we, we may actually have a, a visualization of exactly oh, okay. what you just said <laughs> yeah, just right. coming up. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to blow it, but uh, Carol, just getting back to our optimist friend over here. Earlier this year, I know you wrote a letter to finance ministers around the world where you very clearly said that we need radical action. Um, what were the key things that you wanted them to do? Um, so I think here we come to this, um, can, you know, the uh, biodiversity uh, COP is the voice in the investment community saying we support this action by governments. In fact, we encourage it and we need it. So we need public and private enterprise to come together because what we really need from the global um, biodiversity framework is a requirement for mandatory disclosure. So currently um, with the financial markets, they're not appropriately valuing biodiversity or nature. But that mandatory disclosure will shed a light on information, which will then integrate that into pricing and financial markets. So that's a very important piece. Um, and then the second is to um, certainly to encourage or adopt regulation, which will prevent um, harm that is currently underway. Uh, as you know, we've been speaking about to avoid that harm and instead channel those financial flows to nature positive. So, you know, just in summary, you know, mandatory disclosure for complete transparency, avoiding harm, and then channeling capital to nature positive. Um, Ambassador, if you had a chance to write a chapter two to that letter that, that Carol sent out to the foreign ministers, what would you directly be asking them? So, uh, without doubt, uh, first and foremost, uh, there should be a significant increase in grant financing for uh, uh, ecosystem, nature, uh, and biodiversity, unquestionably. And uh, these, uh, this is significant manifold in increase. Uh, but this, uh, we are now in overtime zone. And this is World Cup. There's no penalty kick options to returning our, our, our planet to stability. So in the overtime uh, zone, we need all packages of resources to pull together. Increase grant financing for biodiversity protection, concessionary financing, and private financing 
pulled together to be able to give us the scale that is now necessary. We are, uh, every day that we delay and that we negotiate uh, uh, longer hours, etc. cetera, uh, the, the cost uh, uh, and the losses are increasing exponentially, not, not in incrementally. We're in, in that type of time, time frame. Also, also to finance uh, ministers, please uh, appreciate, uh, uh, I think, fully. Sometimes we feel uh, we are not appreciated fully the scale and breadth of uh, commitments that uh, many developing uh, countries are making. A small country in Fiji's uh, neighborhood, uh, uh, Kiribati, Kiribati, Kiribati uh, pronounced, uh, uh, has set aside 500 uh, thousand square miles of its ocean for highly marine protected area. Fiji has, is, has a policy of 100% marine managed area of which we are setting aside 30% uh, to highly marine managed area. For Kiribati, uh, they, uh, their sole income is tuna. They have set aside by that much, they have given up 20% of their GDP. That is asking uh, Canada, for example, to shut down nearly whole of its oil industry. There are many countries who make an outside contribution already, not uh, way beyond what they are required to do because they understand uh, the scale of uh, the gravity. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think finance ministers need to understand that we're in this overtime zone, uh, mm. that there are so many countries who are willing to make outside, outsized contribution and, uh, and that uh, let's take this window before this window shuts down. Okay, I, I'm going to take your ball and run with it. Okay, just to use the extra time analogy. KM, is it time to actually sub more private um, sector players on? I mean, what is the role that the private sector should be playing in all of this? I'm going to actually jump in first to some of the points that were raised um, because I think that they're really important. Firstly, with the cost versus losses, there is overwhelming scientific and economic evidence that the cost of investing in nature is five to one in terms of wins to losses, right? So it's really important that we are investing in nature straight away. Secondly, with regards to optimism, I'm with you. I'm also super optimistic. It's not coming from what's happening in these negotiations, though. There is not enough ambitious in the room at all. But what does make me really optimistic is actually uh, our grassroots and frontline groups that are going to go home after this. I come from from a rainforest that was destroyed by the last typhoon that came through at Christmas this time last year. I lost my roof. Um, it was a scary night, to say the least. And that we were safe because we retained 50% of our rainforest, and I will continue to do that after these negotiations. Whether our, hopefully our ministers and our heads of state will come to their senses quicker, because it's not fast enough right now. Um, and with grants, they need to go to IPLCs, they need to go to Indigenous peoples, they need to go to local communities, they need to go to youth like myself. Uh, with my group, we protected an area of pristine rainforest that's critical habitat for, that's the size of Montreal. This is a huge area and we did this with $150,000 over five years. So when we talk about all of these big financial flows, I do want to also put a spotlight that it actually doesn't really cost that much mm. if we're funding the right people. So with regards to your question on private sector, absolutely. Because I feel and what I've seen this week is that the private sector is actually the ones that are seeing just how urgent it is. They're reading these incredible reports that are coming out from the IMF, from the World Bank, from McKenzie's, from Swiss Re. They're all saying that nature investment is a number one solution to this triple planetary crises that we're facing and that the private sector has all the power, I believe, to really change the conversation and really drive these policies. And I think that we're going to see this more and more because I think that from what I've seen, and I'm very um, involved in the negotiations right now, it's not moving fast enough. Mm. And there has to be more of a groundswell of where the real money is in order to make these policy changes. Well, I mean, so your, your Mary Penges is, is nodding, uh, you know, very... <laughs> passionately as, as you're speaking. <laughs> just before I get your take on it, though, I, I'm just going to show you all um, some, some pictures now of mangrove planting. It's the kind of thing that, KM, you're talking about, you know, hands-on making a difference. Now, while there may be a, a huge alignment between economic development and protecting biodiversity, there are short-term costs that will need to be met to help finance a transi transition to a, a different economic model. And this comes at a time when the global economy has some 
real challenges in front of it. And, you know, issues like sovereign debt are very real and very punishing. This is surely a space where organisations like the World Bank step in. Um, what are the biggest obstacles facing the bank at the moment? The, the biggest obstacles facing the bank or facing the countries that we're... Well, we know, I think we've all laid out, I think very <laughs> yeah. passionately we've heard from, yes. from our, our two spokespeople. But, you know, for the World Bank to step in and make a difference, what are the, uh, have you got stumbling blocks in your way? I, I wouldn't say, uh, it, you know, what we are seeing is that we have to address the policy gap and the financing gap. And the policy gap is about, uh, you know, framing what is it that we need to do, including, you know, uh, what you were saying. We, we want to make sure that we are going to help the the, mon the funding goes to the people who really need it and that you will have the change that's going to happen. Uh, and I just want to say something about, about that because, you know, measurement and data become important because otherwise how do you know uh, that you, you've reached uh, the target that you're trying to, to have, which is uh, reducing the nature loss, for instance. So valuing nature is very important. And this is where uh, what we do at the bank uh, with what we call uh, a natural capital accounting becomes very important. It sounds very boring and sounds like something accountants come up with, but it's really about how do you value nature in, in your GDP and how do you uh, make sure that the, the, the ecosystem services like uh, air, like water, are, have the proper economic value? Otherwise, it will get wasted, right? And then you won't get, you will have the nature losses that will have that very uh, big impact on development. Let me just uh, quote you that this morning we had a really good session with the finance minister, ministers, and the minister from Uganda. We, we've on, we only have 18 countries that have uh, a, that we have helped with this natural capital accounting, including Uganda. He identified specifically if uh, we have this forest uh, degradation, this is the, the losses that I'm gonna, my country's gonna have, and this is the livelihood losses, this is the jobs losses, et cetera, et cetera. So you can identify, this is what's gonna happen if I don't do anything. So you can identify, right? And what needs to be done is about the policies that, what, what needs to be done. Then where does the money come from, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you get to the financing gap. And here, I mean, the World Bank, uh, I, I would say maybe the, the, the main obstacle is having enough funding to be able to make sure that you get uh, to address this very big challenge. Uh, and we need to do more of what we're doing, which is maybe two things, just to uh, be brief about it. We talk about uh, greening uh, finan uh, finance and financing green, right? I hope I got that right. So right. greening finance, meaning how, what, what are the kind of uh, investments and financing, if, uh, whether it's concessional funding from uh, the World Bank or government budgets, helping governments to identify green budgets or investments that are nature positive uh, and having climate and development outcomes. Uh, uh, we at the bank, we, we, we have uh, funded uh, 2.8 billion uh, sorry, 2.9 billion uh, in biodiversity and uh, bio to, to finance biodiversity losses, uh, projects that will reduce biodiversity losses and ecosystem, uh, improve ec ecosystem services. And, but it comes from 350 million uh, trust funds uh, that, are, that generate 2.5 billion uh, IDA and IBRD lending, right? Why, why is that important? Because we reduce the cost of borrowing to the country because who would otherwise not borrow for mm -hmm. biodiversity. Uh, and that allows them to uh, undertake, uh, have real economic return in terms of uh, jobs and, and economic growth. A concrete example is our forestry sustainability project in Ecuador, uh, which uh, they borrowed and it's a sustainable forest program which has clear returns for, for livelihoods. They would not have borrowed if they did not get that concessional rate. So to the ambassador's point that we do need more concessional resources uh, to come in to catalyze this kind uh, of funding. Now on greening of finance, uh, really it's about um, green bonds, blue bonds, uh, and the World Bank has been uh, doing, uh, has been the first to issue the green bond in 2008. Now many countries are issuing uh, green bonds. We've, we issued the first blue bond uh, help uh, Seychelles issue the first blue bond uh, recently, and we have a rhino bond. I want to <laughs> publicize the rhino bond because the rhino bond 
is a wildlife conservation bond uh, uh, which funds uh, rhino conservation right. in South Africa. Right. And it's very re related to the, to the outcome, right? So, 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 I mean, incredibly tailored in that case, a bond that's incredibly tailored for, for just yes. the rhinos. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I just wanted to go back to, to the ambassador because, I mean, you said very eloquently what the World Bank's aspirations are and what their activity is. But as far as other multinational organizations, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking about the United Nations, for example, are they doing enough, in your view, to be helpful? So, uh, just come back from uh, across the... If you could put the microphone a bit closer. Uh, just come back from across the uh, corridor from the GEF, uh, for example. Uh, GEF has a small grants program. Uh, by much of the biodiversity work is a series of small community-based, indigenous uh, society-based, youth-based actions on mangrove uh, uh, restoration, coral reef restorations, etc. There are many, many small grants. And uh, these are not easy. We have to learn it, uh, understand the science of uh, it takes a fair while for mangroves to regenerate. And, uh, and so the UN, in a coherent way, uh, should be able to provide systemic and uh, sustainable financing over the medium term for these type of uh, learning to take place. And when the learning takes place, then I think we should uh, uh, be able to come to the World Bank, as we are doing right now, Mary, to, uh, we are uh, talking to World Bank right now, uh, yeah. to take a concessional loan to create jobs for nature. We have about 15,000 young people leaving uh, uh, universities and high schools in Fiji. Something like 20% of them will be entering into some type of a Jobs for Nature program in a couple of years' uh, time that shows us the scale of our ambition. So that's uh, the, the combination. Okay. But both sides need predictable financing. It can't be stop and start. And my last point is that uh, the idea that you can do biodiversity and, and uh, nature restoration in three-year programs, that's a myth. These are 10-year programs. These yeah. are five, 10, 15-year programs. Uh, so we have to change our mindset as well. Yeah? Well, I mean, you're getting a universal a nod uh, of approval from, from the panel. I, I just want to show you all a, a statistic before we sort of develop this further. Um, so some 80% of people around the world are living in areas with biodiversity and ecosystem degradation. In rich countries, it is not the case. So I wonder, Carol, uh, do you think that's one of the reasons we haven't seen as much progress as we should, because it's not happening in rich countries' backyards? Hmm. Well, I think we can ask ourselves a lot of questions about why I think, you know, I find myself often asking how we've gotten to where we are. Um, I think there's a short-termism that kicked in at some point that made financial markets, corporations, governments, begin to sacrifice our long-term health and well-being, or in effect, the systems that we rely on for stability for the sake of short-term profits. And, you know, as an investor, you know that it's the long-term that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the perspective is going to be important, and unfortunately, we've we've pushed ourselves to this paradigm where um, our challenges are now a crisis, which has become short-term in its nature, and is now picking up. That doesn't mean so. That's getting others to focus on the solution, okay. which will be helpful, but not where we want to be. So it's, it's not a great answer for why it's happening, um, you know, short-termism, but uh, it is in the here and now, so I think we're focusing on the solutions, and there's a lot to be done, as can be heard by the other panelists. Right. Um, it's, it's time now to, to open this up a little bit. So uh, project syndicates partner publications from across the globe have been sending in questions. 
Uh, let me put this first one to you. Uh, it's from Pei Ying Hung, who's editorial director of CM Media in Taiwan. And uh, Pei Ying says, what concrete measures do developing countries take to balance maintaining biodiversity and developing industries that might undermine habitats? Um, who would like to? Murray would like to take that. Could you repeat the last part? The, yeah. What do developing countries? Right, okay, so what concrete measures do developing countries take to balance maintaining biodiversity and developing industries that might undermine habitats? So it's getting that balance. I, I think getting the balance is, you can do it with the right kind of uh, policy framework. Like for instance, uh, if, you, if you take agriculture, uh, how do you continue producing food without uh, having, a, you know, destro destroying the forest or destroying the land or uh, utilizing the water to the point where uh, you don't have any mo more water or that you're using fertilizers that emit methane, right? Uh, you, you need to switch. Uh, the, the mindset to, to say, okay, I can still produce food in a sustainable and smart way uh, by reducing the f use of fertilizer, take away the fertilizer subsidy, uh, and uh, put a price to water <laughs> so that you are not going to waste water. Uh, and so you will end up you making uh, producing more food with less water, less pesticide, uh, less fertilizer, uh, so th and and you would also improve the productivity and and yield of the farmers mm. and increase the livelihood, right? So it can be done, and you have to you have to uh, introduce policies and regulations that disincentivize the the nature losses, but put an, a big incentive uh, to uh, I the investment in nature that will also yield. Uh, e still yield uh, e economic production and, and profits. Yeah, I, I, and, Cam, and you know, for, when, when you were speaking earlier, you were like, it's so obvious. <laughs> uh, it, you must be tearing your hair out that something is so obvious to you. Uh, what, what is the best way of actually making people accept what to you is obvious? Um, yeah, I just want to jump into that question as well about, you know, what can developing countries do? Um, developing countries are not working in a vacuum. We're working in a power dynamic, right? Like, developing countries have not faced such high levels of biodiversity and ecosystem degradation as a result of ourselves. The Philippines certainly is not down to 3% of pristine rainforest by ourselves. This has happened because there have been a lot of demands, whether it's from richer countries in Asia or whether it's other countries in other parts. I know specifically right now I'm working on establishing another protected area on my island in Palawan, again, pristine rainforest. This area, and I'm working or trying to work um, in direct conflict with a mining company that is sourcing nickel for the quote unquote electric car revolution. These electric cars will not stay in the Philippines. These are all minerals that will be exported and used for manufacturing for electric cars in the global north. So these questions I worry sometimes of the burden always falling on developing countries because this is where the degradation is happening, but it's not its not a one-way street. Mm -hmm. It happens because of various power dynamics that I think really need to be addressed in this as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to take another question from a Project Syndicate partner uh, publication. My name is Ryan McDonald, and I am the climate editor and environment editor at The Globe and Mail. I'd like to welcome all the delegates and panelists today to Montreal and to Canada. Uh, my question deals with biodiversity, obviously, and um, I'll start by saying that biodiversity is simply genetics by another name. And countries with high biodiversity also have a high share of the genetic wealth of the planet. So consequently, they might wonder, what is that worth? My question is this, should some of the wealth of that biodiversity be diverted back toward keeping the environment intact and secondly, what is the best way to do that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Um, let's go to you, Ambassador. Um, so the biodiversity in the seas around your island is rich. Can it be monetized, I suppose? I mean, I don't want to paraphrase too much. You, you heard the question. It's a powerful question. I, I, 
my simple way of answering it, there's something fundamentally wrong, uh, Murray, in the universe of economics that when you cut a tree down, it is uh, GDP growth. If you leave it alone, it is, uh, it is uh, pointless and uh, irrelevant to GDP. So we need to, uh, this has, has to change. Uh, so how, how should we think about uh, nature accounting and, uh, of uh, the natural world and, and, uh, and, and, and the resources? And this is a very large question. I, I know World Bank, so many uh, uh, technocrats are working on this. We need a solution uh, to this. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the part that comes before uh, providing a dollar value to the uh, natural and, uh, world and to biodiversity is that uh, we should first of all learn how to keep it secure. We must know what it is and how uh, can we keep it within the universe of a highly protected area. Mm -hmm. that, that is uh, where uh, the first part of the equation is and I hope uh, uh, that good sense prevails. We have high ambition coming out of uh, uh, COP, uh, COP15, uh, that in the UN system uh, this year we are able to lock in a bio, uh, BBNJ, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction framework so that the 90% of oceans and the biodiversity in the uh, global oceans that is not protected is also given some type of uh, uh, legal protection. So that's uh, part one. Part two uh, is that countries which are extremely rich in, in uh, biodiversity, this should count uh, as, as uh, economic assets. They are not. Mm. And uh, there's nothing we can do uh, about it today. But that's how, how cruel the current uh, international economic system is. It is, uh, you could almost say, uh, uh, there's a biodiversity colonialism of some sort that you could uh, use harsh, harsh languages uh, like that, that by deliberately not valuing uh, biodiversity and the natural world, uh, we are continuing on a highly exploitative uh, uh, economic system at which uh, some of the poorest countries uh, on the planet are most disadvantaged. Yeah. And so that is, uh, uh, part of that is about uh, economics. I think the much larger part of that is about power and so, your question to the finance ministers of the world is, 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 uh, is a very powerful one. This is ultimately about power and how power is organized in the global system. So, I mean, I, I want to flick that over to Carol, who was the instigator of that letter. Do you recognize that, the colonial mindset, uh, as put by the ambassador? Um, we have been working on a project related to forest uh, for several years. It'll probably go on for several decades. And um, we started the project because we recognized that working company by company or issue by issue in our portfolio wasn't addressing system level health. So our first question was why? Uh, and we undertook a root cause analysis of why, despite the fact that we had been talking with corporations about deforestation and land use issue for several decades, the problem persisted. And what it came down to, and I think we've talked about it a little bit or brushed on it, is measurement and value. And I think that's what we're getting to. We need a system that allows us to recognize and acknowledge the value of those ecosystem services that are being provided. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the step, uh, the, and you know, maybe not soon enough, right? So I heard um, somebody quote an African proverb today that was, you know, if you want to go fast, go it alone but if you want to go far, go together. And then they sort of summed it up with, we need to go fast okay. and far. Right. So, okay. <laughs> um, okay. I, you know, I think that, that measurement and value uh, and how to really um, recognize that, because right. once we recognize it, we'll steward that value. Right. Name it, and then you can see it, and then you can do something about it. Um, listen, you've given us so many things to think about. Um, thank you very much to, to our panel. The, the, the big macro issues there.
Let's hear, though, shall we, from the front line of biodiversity loss now. And someone who spent her career close to and fighting for nature. Photographer, conservationist and biologist, Christina Mittermeier. I took a lot of inspiration when I was starting to frame the reason for my work from Martin Luther King, who was leader of the civil rights movement. You have to paint a picture of what is it that we're trying to achieve. And in my dream, the future is one where humanity is able to coexist with biodiversity, where we recognize the value, the economic value of the species and the ecosystems that we share the planet with. Because the economic model that we live in today doesn't recognize the value of species unless they're being exploited. So a dead whale has value, but a living whale has no value. So how do we change that? And I think that storytelling is a great way of introducing audiences to a new, a new way of thinking. And it's an invitation to a lot of people who have never been invited before. What we really want to say with that photograph is whatever's happening to that polar bear is going to happen to other species and eventually is going to come and knock on our own doors. That was an amazing opportunity to photograph what suffering in the animal world looks like. And when the image went viral, we got a real moment of feedback from the world. And there were people that were very grateful that we were shining a light on the suffering of wildlife and the issues. There were also people that were depressed. You know, they felt like there was no course of action that they could personally take. And that was a moment for me personally, for, for Sea Legacy, to, to think about concrete actions that we could give our followers so that they wouldn't be defeated, that then they would feel empowered to be part of the solutions. We are terrestrial. We, we, are, we feel so separate from the ocean. So I don't think people are thinking about the fate of the ocean as the fate of humanity, but it absolutely is. The ocean is the largest and the most influential ecosystem on our planet. And it has deteriorated in a silent and quiet way, out of mind, out of sight. And people don't realize that we are in real trouble. And we're seeing great momentum in some places. Um, do we have the funding to make it happen? No, we have a funding gap of $150 billion to keep the ocean alive. So I want my work, the storytelling, the photography, to be an incentive for more people to pay attention to the oceans and to direct the resources, whether they're philanthropic or investment, to do more for ocean conservation. There's about 400 million indigenous people left on the planet and they represent the largest minority on Earth. They, they're also stewards of about 80% of the biodiversity left on the planet. So on the terrestrial side of the planet anyway. And they have been living in harmony with nature in a balance that ebbs and flows with the seasons and with the need for the resources for millennia. Indigenous people are the last people on this planet that have access to how the operating system of planet Earth works. And we would be wise to listen to not just their values and their insights, uh, but their recommendations for how do we imagine and build a different type of future. I would love to, to look back and know that my, my photography touched the lives of people, that inspired a generation of photographers to be storytellers for our planet. But more importantly, that we inspired audiences to recognize the uniqueness of planet Earth. We are, so far as we know, the only planet that harbors life and it is so beautiful. We depend on a living planet and it is in our self-interest to keep it diverse and abundant and alive. A really powerful reminder there. Uh, what is at stake from uh, Christina Mittermeier? Coming up, we're going to be asking our next excellent panel, whether nature's crisis can generate the same kind of urgency as climate change. And we're going to take you behind the scenes right here in Montreal, asking the movers and shakers whether COP15 can really mark a breakthrough for biodiversity. Join us then.
Imagine a tree. See the roots, the trunk, the leaves, all connected, all functioning together. We can think of our societies in the same way. From the leaves that convert carbon dioxide into the oxygen that fills our lungs, from the mangrove roots that are a crucial wetland ecosystem for wildlife while also protecting livelihoods, sources of food and jobs. Our livelihoods, our well-being and our economies depend on the Earth's ecosystems on sea and land, on the services they provide and on the species that inhabit them. Nature is declining at an unprecedented rate in human history. Nature loss will affect all of us, but particularly the most vulnerable on the planet. If we don't take action now, the effects will be cataclysmic. Just a partial collapse of ecosystems would cost up to 10% of GDP by 2030 for some of the world's poorest countries. Preventing nature loss is not just about conservation, but about fundamentally changing how economies, societies and finances work. And for this to happen, we need change in three important areas. First, nature needs to be placed at the core of development efforts so that countries can fight to avert the crisis, but also invest in opportunities to achieve green, resilient and inclusive development. Second, nature and climate are intrinsically interconnected. We need urgent action to address them together, at all levels in international agreements, in national budgets, in sector strategies and in local policies. Third, finance needs to work for nature. This means shifting finance away from harmful practices and scaling up all types of funding in support of sustainable ones. The World Bank Group is here to support countries with investments, research and a broad range of financial tools to make this happen. Protecting nature is vital to our people, our economies and our planet. Now is the time for all of us to get involved. Welcome back to our second session here in Montreal at the United Nations Biodiversity Conference COP15. Now, our second session today is called The Other COP. Uh, can biodiversity loss make that leap into the public consciousness and the geopolitical machinery in the same way as climate change? We sort of touched on this in, in our first discussion. What needs to be done exactly to make that happen? Well, in a moment, we're going to hear from a really wonderful panel that we have for you. But first, our crew has been around and about for the last week uh, at the Nature Positive Pavilion and beyond, taking a behind-the-scenes look at COP15. So shall we see what they found out? Nature is under threat. In fact, it's under attack. Without nature, we have nothing. Without nature, we are nothing. Humanity has become a weapon of mass extinction. And ultimately, we are committing suicide by proxy. A major United Nations conference on preserving global biodiversity has opened in the Canadian city of Montreal. More than 10,000 delegates, including scientists, government officials and activists, are taking part in COP15. 69% of species populations we're measuring have disappeared since 1970. A million species on the brink of extinction, and yet we've got to find a way to feed 8 billion people on the planet. There's so much to do to bend the curve on nature, so we have to be optimistic that COP15 is the place to tackle that. Nature is not worth nothing. It's actually underpinning the whole of the economy, society, and ultimately civilization. And so the stakes at this meeting could not be higher. We come here on the back of the of the community and what they say, what they want, and most of the time they are they are screaming, "Don't waste the time you have here," you know, because we need nature. A natureza é tudo para nós, é tudo. A natureza é a nossa vida. É 
que é nosso é, espiritual. We want to make sure that at least 30% of the planet, 30% of the land, 30% of the oceans are protected, that we are truly stopping the extinction of species. But I'm incredibly concerned that we keep talking and talking and we don't have any visibility in the horizon of having an ambitious, committed agreement. The handful of countries are holding progress hostage. This COP we will need to call out those countries. We need nothing less from this meeting than a bold post-2020 global biodiversity framework. No excuses, no delays. Promises made must be promises kept. So the message from here in COP15, simple, powerful, urgent. Uh, with me now, Anne Larigaudry is Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Manuel Pulgar Vidal is Global Leader of Climate and Energy at the WWF and former Environment Minister of Peru. Valerie Hickey is with us, Global Director Environment, National, Natural Resources and Blue Economy at the World Bank. And we have Tony Juniper, Chair of Natural England. Um, of course, we also want to hear from you. We always do. So do join us in this conversation. The hashtag to use is nature's moment. Hashtag nature's moment. So let me start. I mean, with so many august people on this panel, where to start? Valerie, first of all, has biodiversity had the attention that it deserves at a global level, do you think? Yes and no. So I think what's interesting is you talked about this being the other cop. I've always called it the family COP, because for years as I've been coming, and many of us been, have been coming to this COP, we're a small family. We're ministries of environment, and we're conservation biologists and NGOs and interested stakeholders. This year at this COP, our family has grown. If you walk around here, not just here outside the negotiating rooms, in the negotiating rooms, you have indigenous peoples, you've got local community representatives, you have the financial sector, you've ministers of finance, ministers of development, not just ministers of environment. So our family has grown, so there's never been more attention than there is now, which is why now we really do have a special moment to make sure that biodiversity and the urgency and the importance of integrating biodiversity nature with development is our chance to make that difference. Okay, well, well let, me, let me bring Anne in. I mean, clearly there is a need for a breakthrough moment. Is this COP it? Well, um, let's, still, let's continue to hope uh, that, that, that it will be. Um, I wanted to write a little bit on the other COP because I, I think that our community, the biodiversity community, should stop having complexes vis-a-vis -vis the climate change convention and uh, should really, uh, really believe uh, in the fact that what we do is so uh, important, at least as important, if not more important, because at the end of the day, why do we care about climate change if it's not because of the impact that it has on life of the planet, including humans, but others. So it's really life that is at the center of, of what we are really uh, talking about. And, and so um, I think, I, I agree, I, I think that um, our uh, audience is growing. We constantly have new uh, people joining in. Since I also represent the science, and, and IBES is about providing scientific reports, this science also is having an impact in informing the opinion and in bringing in uh, new people, including the public, the young people, business and industry. So. Um, there are things that are moving uh, currently. Uh, as we speak now, there are some brackets that are disappearing. Uh, today, we had some improvements on, on the targets on agriculture, which is a huge one. And, and so, yeah, we, we, we still have to, to be determined and mm -hmm. optimistic. So. Well, I, I mean, you're talking about a larger audience, and, and certainly there's a, a lot more scrutiny. Um, uh, Tony, outside this venue, perhaps inside it too, you might have heard this too. There is often skepticism about the entire COP process. Um, I mean, just speak to that for a moment and just how important is this COP? 
I, I think sometimes there, there is a, a distance between the public who vote for the governments who are negotiating here and the rarefied discussions that occur in these global fora. And I do think that is an issue. And, you know, the comparison's been made with climate change, which has connected more with the public, which has raised then the demands upon the political leaders who are negotiating, and it's created a slightly different dynamic. I think part of the problem is the language we use, actually. Uh, so the BBC did a survey, I think about 12 years ago, where they went into the street and they said to people, random members of the public in the road, what do you think biodiversity is? And do you know what the single most popular answer was? A kind of washing powder, right? Which says a great deal about the communications challenge we've got here mm. in being able to convey the importance and the profound nature of this challenge in a way which is going to connect with billions of people. There's 10,000 of us here. There's 8 billion people who are not. And so the distance between this discussion and them, I fear, is a bit too big. And so we have to build that understanding uh, to create that demand and to create that shift. And the difficulty is, in some ways, is that, you know, the science is critical. And there's fantastic scientists here who are doing brilliant work. But it is quite technical. And that, in turn, is leading into a quite technical discussion about policy. And that, in turn, is not necessarily connecting with what's behind the policy, mm. which is economics. And what's behind the economics is popular culture and consumerism and the economic actors which are operating that economy. And behind the popular culture is our collective philosophical perspective, which is now utterly divorced from the realities of how this planet works. And one of the key things here, which I think is a really, really important dynamic, is the very high profile of the indigenous voice. Because those communities still have that philosophical connection with how this planet works. Mm. And so harnessing that wisdom and finding ways in which we can bring that more profound view into all of this, I think is critical. And all of those layers together, they have to add up. And at the moment, we're at a very rarefied layer, and it's not connecting. OK. I mean, you, you're not privy to this, but, you know, while we were sort of assembling and taking our seats, I was saying to Tony, what, what I really want from this session is to lift the curtain so people know what goes on uh, behind the curtain of COP. And you said, well, the one to talk to is Manuel Pulgar Vidal, uh, which mm. is, you know, absolutely right. We're very lucky to have you because you're a former president of the 20th Climate Change COP. I'd really like to draw a, a comparison, if I may, between um, COP27 earlier this year in Sharm el Sheikh. It was attended by over 100 world leaders, over 100. And you look at this COP here in Montreal, Justin Trudeau looks a little lonely, do you mind me saying? I mean, only a couple of others, heads of state, joining him. What difference does it make, that head count? Wow, there could be many reasons. But, but let me compare this COP, CBD COP, with the former one. I went to Sharon Chaik in 2018. Nobody was there. It was amazing. It was really sad. Now we have created momentum, what it is good. And probably the point is that we have momentum for now because we are expecting something strong. We know that we are discussing the global biodiversity framework, and we are looking to do it as important as the Paris Agreement. But be careful. It is not enough with a document. It mm. is not enough with an agreement. For sure, an agreement could be the key piece of a system. But let me use the analogy of a beautiful four-point diamond. So the agreement, it is the political decision. And it should include clear vision, clear objectives, means of implementation, and support mechanism. That is the structure of the Paris Agreement. And that must be the structure of the GBF, because it is the way to then implement it. OK. I, mean, I know you mean a diamond in a different sense. But does this diamond, this COP diamond, not lose a little bit of luster because the USA is not here? Where is the United States? We know that since the beginning, uh, USA decided not to ratify the convention. But we hope that they are observers, and we hope that they could be more active actors, as they have shown by also appointing a person in charge of biodiversity and connecting biodiversity with climate. But let me keep the idea of the three other elements very quickly. The second one, it is about science. It is true. We have to listen to science. And IPBES has already told us that we have five drivers of nature laws, and we have to address those drivers. The third one, and, and, and Tony has already told this, it is how can we connect biodiversity laws in, with the economy? 
that has been probably the key piece of the climate debate. Mm. For, for, for the climate community, it is more than just an agreement. It is about on what it could be your competitiveness as a country, what it could be the future of your corporation, what it could be the future of your community. And the last one, it is whole of society. So the non-state actor's agenda, it is a key one. So I hope that we can keep this momentum alive. Despite what, of what it could be the result and the outcome of this COP15, let's imagine we are in this nature positive pavilion. We don't know yet if the parties will accept the idea of nature positive as a concept. What if not? Are we planning to giving up? No. We have to insist, we have to keep this mm -hmm. momentum alive, we have to develop our actions in a daily basis, and not just to wait until the COP16 in Turkey, probably in Istanbul. That really doesn't make any okay, sense. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, I, I get the message is loud and clear. Um, <coughs> I'm going to show you all some, some pictures, and, and, and I'm going I'm to come to you Je first. So these are pictures that you are very familiar with, I'm sure. <laughs> so you, you, you don't need me to tell you that this is the absolute jubilant scenes from Paris in 2015 where, of course, we did have, we did see a breakthrough <coughs> deal on climate change. Honestly, hand on heart. I know that you are tr saying, look, don't give up hope. It's, but that sort of seems to be setting me up for quite a lot of disappointment this time round. Anne, is that what you're expecting? That this is going to slightly fizzle and maybe, as Manuel's saying, the next one will be better? Well, I'm, I'm still hoping that, that, that we can get a agreement on, on, on quite a few uh, of the targets that are really significant. Yeah, so perhaps there will not be a monitoring framework right away uh, in order to, to, to monitor, and, and, and that might come at COP16 in Turkey. But uh, there is progress on some of the targets. I'm still, I'm still really hoping uh, that we can get an agreement on, on some of those uh, for sure. And then the Paris Agreement, yes, okay, 1.5 degree, but you know, that also was like an, a political uh, target, and when it was, uh, agreed, people already knew that it would not be reached because the science was already saying that we were on a path to more than this. And so even though it was celebrated as a, as a success, uh, really, uh, it, it really was not as much as what people have done about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this convention can do at least as well as uh, the Paris Agreement. Okay. Uh, Tony, just from a UK perspective, uh, what are you hoping to hear? Well, we need the ambition reflected in the agreement. We need nature positive by 2030 and bending the curve from decline and towards recovery. Action on the drivers, a target framework, uh, some level of accountability, something on the finance side. All these things are, are being discussed and there's people working really, really hard as we're sitting here. Teams of people working literally insane in human hours mm. trying to get this over the line. And what we have to not forget is that this is genuinely complicated. 193 countries, different political traditions, different national circumstances, different objectives trying to come together. And so it's almost not surprising that at this stage of the talks, like halfway through, there is an awful lot on the table. And what we have to hope and pray for is that over these coming days, those differences can be bridged, that compromises can be found, and that countries can come out of here with something which reflects the reality of the situation we inhabit, which is the brink of a total ecological disaster on this planet. And if that's not motivation enough to get things over the line, I don't know what is. Mm. And so the next days, we have to wish everybody the very best of luck and entering into a spirit of cooperation and compromise to try and reach the agreement that the world so desperately needs. So, so, Valerie, can I come to you on this? Um, I sort of have an idea of what you will say, you know, what, what does the World Bank want to see happening, but what does the World Bank realistically expect will happen at this COP? The dirty little secret of this COP is that it doesn't matter in terms of what's going to happen outside of the COP. And this is the dance that happened, and it happened for climate change too. Sometimes the COP decisions are out front and they pull everybody with them. 
sometimes the COP decisions are catching up with real life. And I think we're in a moment yeah. where the COP decisions yeah. are catching up and are behind, exactly. are the laggard when it comes to where the frontier of ambition is. We've got the financial sector all over the world talking about rhino bonds. We heard about that in the last panel. Yeah. panel. The bond market is looking to figure out how do we take biodiversity into account? Finance is going green of its own accord. It isn't waiting for a COP decision. But also, let's not forget the Paris Agreement is a biodiversity agreement. That was also our success. It wasn't just that climate change is something different. Climate change and nature are so integrally connected, we can't have one without the other. So I'm also claiming that Paris Agreement was as much a biodiversity success as anything we're going to get out of okay, here. Okay, okay. All right. Well, I mean, let's score it as a win for you as well. That's fine. If it, if that's fine. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to extrapolate from, from what you were saying. Are you then saying that actually there's too much emphasis put on the big political agreements, that the, the real story is somewhere under the surface? I think the real stories are at the country level. It's important to have agreement internationally and globally because we want convergence across countries. Because so much of biodiversity loss is driven by trade, for example, we need convergence across countries so that the trade rules really begin to become nature positive or at least stop encouraging nature negative financial flows and investments. But investment decisions are made at the country level. And that's where the policy gap needs to be closed. That's where we need policy coherence. Yeah. That's where we need countries mm -hmm. figuring out how to, at the minimum, stop nature negative decisions and then begin to go further and go nature positive. Because it's not just about financing biodiversity in protected areas. A conversation around nature can't be a conversation just around the 30%. It's a conversation around the whole 100% of the land and sea. Yeah, what's really interesting and what I, what I hear a lot and what Tony very beautifully articulated, I think, a minute ago was that this is complicated. You just said that. You know, this is really, really complicated. Uh, Manuel, the thing with, with climate change, and you know, claim it if you want as well, <laughs> Valerie has, uh, but you know, in, in terms of mitigation, you have a clear, uh, single, measurable issue when it comes to climate change, carbon emissions. There isn't a single simple metric here to measure, and isn't that actually problematic? It is, for sure it is. But look, even in climate, we have ways to measure mitigation, but not adaptation. That is why we are working in developing the global goal on adaptation. That is one of those clear mandates for COP28 in the, in the UAE. And it is exactly the same with biodiversity. Because the current vision, living in harmony with nature, it's a beautiful one. It's sweet, if we can say it in yeah. some way. But there is no way to measure progress when we think in living in harmony with nature. That is why the importance of nature positive. Because we can give some content to the idea of nature positive to define some metrics. And remember something. The Paris Agreement never mentioned net zero. And that is interesting. The mention in the Paris Agreement, it was a well-balanced in between emission reductions and removals. And after that, the net zero concept that was developed. Mm. And after that, the standards and some entities as science-based target initiative defining a good standard. And now we are in a time in which we are working to bring more credibility to the net zero. So we are defining how mandatory that standard it must be, how can we move from the voluntary basis into a more regulated basis. So what I'm trying to say, it's a process. So if we are able to keep the nature positive alive, and if we are able to agree in some ways to define measurable mechanism for the nature positive, we can then progress into the next step of that system. Okay, I mean, I, 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 hear, I hear you. Like, you know, be patient, the metrics will come. There are, though, some really worrying metrics that we've got already. Um, and I want to show you this, this map, okay? It shows parts of the world most affected by biodiversity loss, according to the WWF. So the lighter the color, the worse the impact. What would a successful COP, in your opinion, do to what we're looking at here? So I think that this, what this map shows is that uh, most of the biodiversity is in developing countries, right? And, and so one thought that comes to me when you ask the question is one element of, of success would be uh, some uh, significant uh, financial uh, means to, to help 
those countries in developing countries who have been able to keep most of their biodiversity, uh, which is not the case of a lot of the developed countries who, who have ensured their development uh, by using uh, their, their biodiversity. And, and so now we have the situation where uh, developing countries have this double challenge, right, of uh, having to develop and of having to also preserve their biodiversity because they want to do so and, and because uh, others are asking them mm. because they no longer have any in their countries. So like, please save the Amazon. Please, we know we want to see elephants in, in Africa and, and all of that. And so, of course, uh, a, a big element of, of the success here is, is to, to, to be able to, to help those who don't have enough of the resources because they're not going to be able by themselves to, to, to protect uh, with a level of enforcement that is necessary and, and also to, to do uh, additional uh, actions on the 70% uh, in addition to the 30%. So, so I mean, so the whole question of sort of indigenous people and, and yeah. their, their stewardship of the land, I know you, you, you brought this up, Tony, as well. Um, some indigenous representatives at this COP have been expressing the worry that this 30-30 push yeah. may actually lead governments to violate their rights to override their stewardship of the land that they know and that they love. How do you go about resolving that clash of principles? I think this is, it's a kind of, it's, it's a wrong conclusion. If we think that going to 30% manage for nature or protect for nature means the exclusion of people, that's just the wrong conclusion. And actually, if you look at maps of the Amazon in Brazil, and you look at the areas of high deforestation and the areas where the forest remains, there's a very high correlation between the remaining forest and where the indigenous people have control of the land. Same thing in, in Peru, I think, Manuel, and also in Colombia. And you can see this very strong uh, positive synergy between indigenous communities having stewardship and ownership and, and political control and the biodiversity still being there. And so whatever this agreement says, it needs to reflect that basic reality. And this goes back to the mindset of the people. I've worked in the Amazon and worked with indigenous people there. And their view of the forest, it's a sacred presence, which is their life support system, and it's embedded in their culture and their worldview. You speak to some other people who are in the logging business or the ranching business, they've got a completely different view of the value of that land. And so the indigenous philosophy, if it is sustained, and if those people have control of that territory, which is still intact, I think this is going to be a very good way of ensuring that those places remain. In fact, I'm also the chair of a little charity called Cool Earth. I'll give them a little shout out. They're doing some work in Peru, uh, in the upper Rio Ene. Uh, Manuel, well, you may have been there. And... Uh, they're, they've done some work there using remote sensing uh, to see what the rate of deforestation is where this community is empowered to look after the forest. And the illegal logging that's going on there is one twentieth of what's going on uh, in forests uh, down, downstream in the catchment where the indigenous people don't have control. Mm -hmm. So this is something which um, I think has got into uh, the wrong place in terms of like nature being about people being removed. This, is, this couldn't be further from the truth in terms of how we need to approach this. Okay, well, I mean, just sort of using that as a springboard then uh, to, to both of you, Valerie and, and Manuel. Valerie, first of all, um, do indigenous voices have enough amplification at things like this? I mean, you said you were happy that the, the family of COP family was growing to include them, but are they loud enough? Are they heard enough? No, and I think it's important that they're heard more, because if they're not at the table, their interests are on the menu. Right. And they've seen this and they know this. You know, these are communities who are some of the poorest communities from an economic indicator level, living in the most biodiverse, richest areas in the world. That's a paradox we can't allow stand. And we can't be making decisions about their biodiversity, their lands, because even though it's never okay for me to disagree with a brain the size of Anne's, I actually don't think biodiversity is, is just in developing countries. I think all biodiversity is local. And I think there's biodiversity everywhere. In Botswana, local biodiversity is elephants. Where I come from in Ireland, it's rabbits. But that's also biodiversity. And I think it's important at COPs like this, we remember that we need to allow the people who live with that biodiversity, who have to steward it, 
many of whom do it at the risk to their lives, certainly at the risk to their livelihoods. Mm. They need to be at the table more, and it's our job at the World Bank, it's the job of everybody here, and it's jobs of negotiating teams to make sure that where indigenous peoples are in their country, they're with them at the negotiating okay. table. Okay, uh, Anne's big brain wants to come back in, Anne and Manuel, I, I welcome you, <laughs> just itching to get back in. Go on, Anne. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Um, no, just to, to, to flag that uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, an, an element of work that uh, IBIS has been doing since its early stages is to develop uh, an indigenous and local knowledge component. And so that all of the reports and every, everything that we've been doing, and that's novel for uh, assessments. And so like if you take the IPCC reports, that has not yet happened in IPCC, where uh, the reports are built on knowledge, not only on science, but also on indigenous and local knowledge and there has been an entire uh, method that has been uh, developed over the years where there are dialogues with various indigenous people and local communities then they also are involved in all of the chapters of the assessment we call for um, material from indigenous communities and we receive lots of things such as pieces of art and videos and stories and everything. So that really has enriched uh, a lot uh, the work of uh, IBES and we have benefited a lot uh, including uh, for uh, all of the big uh, key findings that have come from the assessments. Um, uh, Manuel, in the last session somebody used, it was the ambassador for Fiji, uh, used the expression the colonialism the, uh, of the mind when it comes to biodiversity and I wonder if that colonialism of the mind also extends to hearing indigenous people in your Yeah, experience. in some way, yes. But I think that in some way the voice of indigenous people, it is growing. And we are listening to them well. And also it has been clearly demonstrated that the rate of deforestation in indigenous uh, land, it is the lowest one. So we have to recognize that and continue empowering indigenous voice, but also indigenous action. Something that it is very important, it is also to provide appropriate technology. It is amazing in the Amazon, a good technology provided to indigenous people that could empower them and also could make them able to defend their own lands, it's amazing. Mm. And I, I am referring to satellite information, I am referring to Drones. technology that could monitor. Yeah, ab absolutely, and, 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 and all of that. Yeah. So yeah. I think that for sure, we have to continue working in empowering them, in respecting their rights, also in making them able to manage their own resources, as it was announced in Glasgow in COP26 by the UK government, that they will provide a fund to defend their rights, and they will be in charge of that, of those funds. So it's right, uh, uh, indigenous-based finance. So we have to continue improving, and, and, and I am pretty sure that by doing that, we will achieve our objective. And, and, and let me say something that you mentioned. We are not starting from scratch. The point is that we are not in 1992. We are in 2022, 30 years after we dis, uh, approved or adopted the convention. And by now, this collaboration in between our climate objective and our nature objective can really contribute to strengthen this convention. So, so by developing mechanisms that can promote convergence, we will make more feasible and more irreversible and right. unstoppable our national positive objective. Okay, okay. Uh, regardless, regardless of, of, you know, Manuel's told us to keep a lid on expectation next time maybe, but, you know, if that's fine with Manuel, regardless of whether there is a, a, a big political agreement or not at this COP. Uh, Valerie, what does the world need to do next on biodiversity? Mm -hmm. Three things. We heard in the last panel about closing the policy gap. I think it's key. We have to reform and repurpose harmful subsidies. We have to make sure that finance is green. We talked about the financing gap. I think we have to be careful not to get caught in the trap when we talk about finance of only talking about quantity, who much, how much and who pays. We have to start talking more about access to finance and about the impact of financing and the quality and making sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. But the other gap, and this is building on the conversation around indigenous peoples and local communities, is there's an organizational gap we have to fill. 
too often indigenous peoples don't have a seat at the table or not getting access to the finance they need because they don't have the administrative capacity as organizations. They have the technical knowledge to manage their forests. They know how to do it much better than we do or whatever ecosystem that they're protecting. But they don't have the administrative capacity to write a GEF proposal, for example. So one of the jobs that we have to do is instead of relying on, on intermediaries all the time, the NGOs we often finance who trickle down, we have a trickle down biodiversity finance approach that hope, we hope the money will go from the intermediaries down to the indigenous people. We need to stand down the intermediaries and stand up the indigenous people and local community organizations so they can get direct access. Mm -hmm. So they're the people who need the money. They know what to do with it. And we know because we've seen from the science that they do it better than the rest of us. Mm. Um, I mean, it's such a fascinating discussion. I, I'm going to take some uh, questions from some of the uh, Project Syndicate partner publications. Uh, as you know, they exist around the world. Uh, this is from Dr. Oluka Yode Oleleye, who's a consulting editor at Business AM in Nigeria. And he says, uh, the world seems stuck with key industrially produced staples, things like corn, wheat, rice, soybeans. How can we cope with future food security challenges arising from limited varieties of food and the resulting land degradation? Maybe, Anne, you want to take that. Well, so, um, well, biodiversity offers uh, a great diversity of food uh, and actually quite a bit of it needs to be rediscovered and would represent a, a source of uh, diversity and in some cases would increase uh, food security. Uh, we, we, we've seen how the world has completely reduced and lost uh, a lot of uh, genetic diversity, particularly when it comes to domesticated uh, animals and, and plants. And that's a, a big issue here at, at this COP to raise awareness about this and about the fact that uh, people all around the world, they really need to reconquer uh, the old varieties uh, that they were using, which are often better adapted uh, to local uh, conditions, including sometimes with more resistance to climate change issues, and that is one element of the response. There would be many others, but but there again, uh, biodiversity could be uh, a response to to uh, the, the, this question. Yeah, uh, it was also a message that came through very clearly from from the last one, which is don't see biodiversity as an economic drain, but as a an economic opportunity. Uh, this is a question that comes from Taiwan, uh, Pei Ying Hung, uh, who asks, since geopolitical tensions have been growing recently, especially between the powers with the most resources that could contribute to biodiversity, how should the international community promote cooperation? I mean, I'm going to come back to you, Tony, because, <laughs> uh, you know, if you've got two things which are clashing, how do you make them marry and play nice? I think this, this requires there to be uh, an appreciation of the common interest in all of this. It is like climate change. No one country can solve it. Every country will suffer the consequences of not fixing it. And so whatever the differences between countries on other subjects, there is a common interest here that everyone needs to embrace. And the extent to which countries do that, well, we hope over these coming days we'll, we'll see them rising to that particular challenge, but, but it's going to require uh, an appreciation of, you know, not only the national interest, but the collective interest and in recognising that one is a subset of the other. Mm. And we're going to have to fix this together. There's no alternative. Oh, well, Valerie, you're, you're, you're nodding, but I, I want to hear what you say. Geopolitical tensions certainly have been growing, but so too has multilateralism. One of the wonderful things that you would find if you went to the negotiating room as we sort of go behind the curtain here at the COP, is that those geopolitical tensions aren't seeping into the negotiations. There really is a sense of multilateralism, a sense of common purpose, in part forged by the fact that we're a family, by the fact that these negotiators have been doing this just on this GBF for the last four years, since the Sharm El Sheikh CBD mm. COP four years ago. But they've been working together for years and for decades, and they understand that something has to be done. And they understand that an agreement on biodiversity begins to shine a light on the fact that multilateralism can work, even while we have tensions. It's not totally an either or. Either we work together or we fight each other. We can move forward on some agendas even as others are stuck. And, and, and let me add something. Sometimes geopolitical tensions and times of emergency can dynamize more innovative solutions. Let's see Europe 
because of the energy crisis. For sure, this is more related to climate. How much Europe it is understanding that the next step in relation to energy, it must be to cooperate. Okay. No alternative. And it is happening the same in the U.S. This Inflation Reduction Act, that it is about inflation, that it is an economic consequences of this geopolitical tension. It is about clean energy. It is about energy efficiency. So the point is, sometimes we do need to have this kind of tensions to react. And if we are innovative, we can help the world to produce and to shift into a transformational change. Okay. Uh, we, we are running out of time, and you are such an articulate um, panel that I feel almost embarrassed off, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm going to give you a question that involves six words, but you have to give me a six-word answer. No more than six words, ladies and gentlemen. Will this COP be a success? Anne. I'm counting. Mm -hmm. Shrugging and facial <laughs> expressions do not count. <laughs> well, let us hope that it will be a success. Too, okay. okay. <laughs> I think there's more too many. We went very fast. Okay. Okay. Manuel. By defining to the world a good pathway. None of you can count. It's <laughs> becoming obvious. Uh, Valerie Hickey. Yes, even if we don't get everything. Okay. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, but she was closer than you were. Okay, Tony. <laughs> that was a good answer. <laughs> That's four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we must hope and pray. We must hope and pray. Okay, that what that fits. And that's all I'm taking. Listen, thank you so much. What, a, what an excellent panel. Please join me in thanking uh, Anne and Manuel and Valerie and Tony. Uh, really, really very interesting conversation. Thanks to our fantastic panel for such an invigorating discussion. Who better to wrap up now than Elizabeth Maruma Mrema, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. If we don't act now in this COP15, what we are actually saying is that we are ready to perish with this planet. We are ready to ensure that our children, grandchildren, future generation will have no place to live. If we are saying biodiversity is the foundation of life, there will be no food, there will be no water, there will be no medicines which have come from nature, there will be no jobs, there will be no livelihood. So if we bring all this together, we cannot afford to come out of this COP without a framework. And yet also the economists are telling us 50% of the global GDP is actually dependent on nature and clearly say half of the global economy is at risk as the result of loss of biodiversity. We are dependent economically because that's where business case is. That's where the food is coming from, the medicines for health, the jobs, when you look at all this, this has to be the moment for nature. Currently, negotiators are in different rooms negotiating what will be the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. A framework which one intends to create that roadmap pathways with actionable targets to reverse and halt biodiversity loss by 2030. A framework that will ensure whole hands on deck whole of government, whole of society approach in taking actions for halting loss of biodiversity is a framework for all. Everybody has to play their role, be it indigenous peoples, local community, business, financial institutions, the youth, the women, you and me. And this is what will be key to take us to 2030 and to 2050, our biodiversity long-term vision of living in harmony with nature. A framework will also ensure that there will be a movement of financial flows from harmful subsidies to subsidies which are green and positive for biodiversity. Financial flows also for implementation from all sources, international, national, regional, a domestic level. A framework which will also ensure that by 2050, biodiversity is well managed, conserved, protected, restored, and sustainably used with the benefits fairly and equitably shared. All of us will come out of here literally saying action is needed today.
business as usual is what has brought us here. So literally, COP15 is that moment for nature or Montreal moment for nature. Really powerful message there from Elizabeth Marema. Uh, I just want to thank you for, for joining us here in Montreal and online for Nature's Moment, brought to you by Project Syndicate in association with the World Bank and High Impact. Um, this is a really big moment, or it could be a really huge moment for biodiversity, for our planet, for us all. I'm really glad you could join in the conversation. Goodbye. <laughs>